Good afternoon and welcome honored guests, Madam Kristalina Georgieva, ministers, good evening and welcome to this event. We are very happy to see so many of you here today and the topic is of utmost importance and interest. The World Bank study will now be introduced, Women, Business and Law 2019, a decade of reforms. Uh, and it will present an index measuring legal rights for women throughout their working lives in 187 economies worldwide. The data covers a 10-year period, not only to understand the current situation, but to see how law affecting women's equality of opportunity have evolved over time. I will leave it to uh, the interim president of the World Bank, Madame Kristalina Georgieva, to present the findings uh, in a short while. But first, uh, let us welcome Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iceland, Mr. Guðlaugur Thor Thorðason, who will give the opening remarks. Mrs. Kristalina Georgieva, Interim President of the World Bank Group, your uh, Excellency, Minister of Development, Cooperation of Denmark, Mrs. Ola Turnes, other distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this launching event for the 2019 report on women, business, and the law. We are pleased to be able to partner with the World Bank on this important matter and welcome all the distinguished speakers. Gender equality is one of the cornerstones of Iceland's foreign policy. Iceland contributes actively to the promotion and protection of human rights with emphasizes on women's rights and equal opportunity to all, which are values that we Icelanders hold dear. Over the past few decades, we have witnessed increased respect for women's human rights and various legal reforms and gender responsive policies. We have also seen active economic and political participation of women, but in Iceland, almost 80% of women participate in the workforce. All this combined has raised well-being and prosperity in Iceland. Without the women's movement in this country and constant vigilance working on gender equality, we would not have such a thriving society. In our international development cooperation, we put emphasizes on gender equality and women's empowerment as we strongly believe in gender equality as a human right and as a driver of economic and social development. It is our belief that by supporting countries towards gender equality, they will reap the benefits as a society. Iceland has col collaborated with Malawi and Uganda, our partners in bilateral, bilateral development cooperation, for over three decades, and we continue to support their progress in women's rights and empowerment. But without half the team, the game, of, game cannot be won. Therefore, we also actively work to engage men in the fight for gender equality. Iceland was a pioneer when it introduced exclusively paternity leave in the year 2000. It has changed norms and behavior in a meaningful way and enabled men to engage in their child children's early lives and at the same time been supportive to women's constant participation in the labor market. A recent OECD report commissioned by the Nordic Council of Ministers shows that improvements in gender equality have contributed considerably to economic growth in the Nordic countries. It revealed that the steady increase of women in the labor market can account for 10 to 20% of the Nordic region GDP 
per capita growth in the past 40, 50 years. Today, most people agree that gender equality is a no-brainer and that discrimination against women should not exist. Still, complicated challenges remain, both in Iceland and in other parts of the world. In Iceland, we have put in place laws to ensure equal representation in boards. However, this has yet to be translated into more female CEO, CEOs. We also have a new law to enforce a decade-old legislation on equal pay, but we still need to address the labor market segregation that contributes largely to the absolute gender pay gap. It is good to take stock occasionally as we are about to do here today and focus on how we tailor our national policies so they advance gender equality. It is beneficial for us to discuss how we go from good policies to good practice. I commend the World Bank on the new report and the intern president for her commitment to gender equality within the World Bank group. The bank has done a good job in addressing women's rights and their participation, voice and agency in the labor market. But we can always do more. The entire world has collectively agreed, agreed to aim for a gender equal world by 2030 through our shared sustainable development goals. The equal participation of women at all levels the respect for the human rights and the empowerment of women and girls will be fundamental to our success in reaching all the other goals. And now it is my pleasure to welcome warmly the interim president of the World Bank, Mrs. Kristalina Georgieva, who will introduce the main findings of the Women, Business and the Law Report. Welcome. Honourable Minister Thorarsson, do I get that right? Close. <laughs> um, well, I have an excuse why I didn't get it right. This is my very first uh, visit to Iceland. I have to come here more often to learn how to pronounce the names. And uh, with uh, uh, my... Uh, um, um, admission that this is my first visit, I also want to say that um, uh, Iceland and all the uh, Nordic Baltic countries uh, have been leading the world on the topic we are discussing today. But beyond that, you have been leading the world on concentrating on a comprehensive approach to development. And I am very pleased that we will be sitting uh, on this podium with the uh, Millennium Development Goals right behind us. Let me put the report in a uh, broader context. Why is gender equality so important? It is hugely important, of course, because ethically it is the right thing to do to respect everyone for who they are and be inclusive in development. But it is also economically hugely important. There is simply no way we can have a prosperous world if we hold half of its population back. Uh, we did a uh, study recently on the wealth of our planet, how big it is. And we actually calculated that when we take natural resources, land, minerals, fisheries, uh, physical resources, the physical capital of the planet, planet buildings, roads, uh, factories, and the human capital, all of us, people, the total wealth is a staggering $1,123 trillion. This is how wealthy we are. That on its own uh, is a quite an interesting finding, but more interesting was the recognition that in this wealth of ours, 
two thirds is us people. The largest part of wealth on the planet are its people. And the richer country is, the higher is the share of this wealth. The poorer country is, the lower the share of human capital. And then we asked a very uh, important question that leads us to the topic today. What does it cost us as wealth lost because women are not yet equal to men? And we came up with a hundred and sixty trillion dollars less wealth of our planet because of gender inequality. And I call this the world's most expensive solvable problem. <laughs> and of course, laws are part of solving it, but they are not all. We can have the laws on the books, but if we don't implement them, they would mean very little. So my very uh, first opening point is to say, hugely important to have gender, gender equality. It starts from changing the laws towards equality, but doesn't stop there. So how are we approaching it with the report we are presenting? We are following the life of women, and then we are looking at the uh, key components of this lifespan of a woman. Uh, can a woman freely go whenever she wants without permission? Can she start a job on her own by her own choice? Is she being paid equal to men? Can she decide on her own when to get married who to marry. When she has children, is it possible to look after children without pulling out of economic activities? And are parental rights such that both men and women can contribute to looking after children? Can a woman start a business, get credit, hold assets, participate in the economy actively? Can she manage assets, inherit them, pass them to the next uh, generation? And last but not least, does she have equal pension rights? Can she work as long as men? And will her pension be equal to the pension of a man? So these are the par parameters we measure. We have indicators uh, in some categories, four in some uh, five that we measure accurately. We cover 187 uh, economies. And uh, this particular report is very interesting because it tells us what has happened in a decade. So this is what has happened in a decade. We have gone further on the road to gender equality. And it is really good news. We have improved by almost five points. And uh, what I, this slide doesn't show you is that change has happened everywhere. 131 economies have undertaken reforms to gender equality. In some cases, uh, very significant steps forward. And yet, what we have to recognize is that with all this progress, 75, almost 75 uh, uh, out of 100, it's a very simple statement. In an average economy, a woman today has only three quarter of the rights of a man. And the progress we have made in 10 years, improvement of close to five points, means that even I am to live as long as the uh, uh, British Queen's mother, I will not see gender equality in my lifetime unless we speed up. That would take us 50 years to get to uh, a, a, a uh, hundred if the speed of change is uh, such as it is now. 
We have our leaders in the, uh, uh, in the world when it comes down to gender equality, and uh, uh, the uh, Baltic and Nordic countries are by far, as a group, the most uh, impressive in how you have been uh, addressing the issues of uh, gender equality. Uh, so the average score of this part of the world is an impressive 97.51. And uh, in many cases, uh, it is not 100 because of a relatively small issue that can be easily corrected. And by the way, this is why we have the report, so people can see what others are doing and do it themselves to get to 100. Since we are in Iceland, I want to talk about something really very interesting that is happening right here as of last year. And it is a very uh, clear tightening of the role of the law when it comes down to us, one of the most dramatic areas of inequality, inequality of pay. What Iceland is now doing is requiring a certification of independent party of whether companies and governance services that employ 25 people or more do have equal pay in reality rather than on the books. Uh, and I, you know, I want to, uh, uh, to say we need more of that creativity and then spreading it around as quickly as possible. Um, uh, I, I would, uh, I'm not going to go through all the uh, uh, innovations, but I would want to flag another one that is really important, and it is uh, in Sweden on parental leave. What is the innovation of Sweden? Sweden says we want to make sure that we not only we have 480 days of paid parental leave, but that a minimum of 90 days is taken by each of the parents. So. Uh, we can have 300 days where the family decides who is to take the leave, but we are demanding that 90 days minimum is taken by each of the parents. Uh, I, I am uh, uh, keen to stress that when we talk about uh, equality in the world, learning from each other, we have found to be the fastest way to accelerate progress creating a little bit of competition through that kind of uh, ranking, but mostly allowing to share new ideas and legal actions faster than it would have happened otherwise. So let me uh, bring to your attention a couple of interesting observations from that analysis. Uh, some of them were even, I would say, a little bit surprising, like which is the region that has undertaken most reforms? Those of you who haven't looked into the report, you can guess. Which region do you think has taken most refor reforms? Africa, that is exactly true. Sub-Saharan Africa by far has undertaken most reforms. For fairness, Sub-Saharan Africa has many countries. Uh, for fairness, it has been, in many parts, falling somewhat behind, uh, like uh, a country that has jumped 30 points, DRC, Democratic Re Republic of Congo, jumped 30 points. But before it jumped, a woman had basically the rights of a child. So making progress from a low base, of course, is, uh, is always uh, easier. But it is still very positive, and it comes also out of our development persistence, making sure that gender discussions happen in countries because it is important for countries to make progress in the fight against uh, poverty. Uh, where is that we have seen fewest reforms? Unfortunately, it is in the region that is still furthest behind, uh, in Middle East and North Africa. There, a woman has less than 50% of the right of a man. And yet, Middle East North Africa has taken few reforms. As a result, they are actually falling further behind because others are moving uh, faster. Uh, 
we are seeing in the last years, and partially it is the benefit of uh, women, business, and the law, that in a number of Middle Eastern countries, there is more appetite for reform. We are also seeing it because we are making a simple economic case. You cannot have a vibrant middle class when you're holding your women back, especially when they are highly educated as many women in the Middle East are. Uh, we also see a very positive uh, fact in reforms in fragile countries. And I can tell you that warms my heart more than anything else in this, in this report, uh, that a country like Afghanistan will eliminate restrictions to women to get a passport without permission, uh, or uh, to have the uh, decisions to actually put on the books a requirement for equality of pay. Uh, even on more difficult questions that are related around protection of women, we are seeing big progress in fragile states. To my mind, knowing the price women pay when they're not protected, laws taken against sexual harassment at the workplace and against violence uh, at home, violence uh, towards women, are maybe the most impressive area where over the last 10 years, progress has really accelerated. We have 35 countries that have introduced legal protection against sexual harassment at the workplace. This means that two billion women enjoy that legal protection uh, today. And of course, I want to stress again, law on the book doesn't mean the law is implemented. Work still needs to go uh, uh, further. So these are the gaps in different uh, regions. Uh, of course, uh, as Europeans, we all are happy to see that Europe uh, is, uh, is leading the way. Uh, we, as Europeans, also need to admit that uh, Europe is leading the way not only because we have the right values, we do, but also because we don't have enough people to work. Our demography requires us women to roll our sleeves and make sure we have uh, wealthy societies. Uh, let me let me finish on a fairly uh, positive uh, note that the recognition of gender equality as good economics has advanced. The uh, uh, champions for gender equality, many of them are, I'm sure in this room, are not just women. There are many men who very genuinely believe that it is a more productive, more peaceful, and I would add a happier world where women have equal rights to men. In my organization, we walk our talk consistently. We made the commitment to, to bring the World Bank to gender equality in senior management by 2020. We reached that goal last year in 2018, and we are a better organization as a result. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Georgieva. Uh, you raise our hopes with the good news about global progress, but it is nonetheless striking that in 2019, globally, women only enjoy three quarters of the legal right, rights of men in the measured areas. Uh, now, we have three speakers from the private and the public sector in Iceland and from the public sector in Malawi. Uh, we, they will give uh, snapshots of gender-related uh, initiatives and ways to promote gender balance. And I ask you speakers, please, to note that you only have four minutes each. Let me first invite to the stage Mr. Stefan Sigurdsson, uh, the CEO of SCENE, a telecommunication and media company. Stefan, as a CEO of Vodafone, received the, the annual award for gender equality in the workplace in 2017 for the progressive gender and family policies. Stefan will discuss ways a private sector company has taken to improve gender equality in the workplace. 
Stefan, the floor is yours. And if you would climb onto the stage, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, having me. I, I'm going to go through the uh, process we had. It was basically like a strategy process we have. We decided to uh, put gender equality on the, on, the, on the agenda. We started in 2014, and, and what we started doing was to have a plan. And we had a committee, and we had a process, just wha what you do when you, you, you are implementing a strategy. So this continuous process, we, were, we had surveys, and then we looked at this what came out of the surveys, and we had ini initiatives. Three, year li three years later, we won uh, the Gender Equality war Awards for, uh, for a company. So I guess the strategy worked. But building culture is very important in, in my mind, but, but the process helps building the culture, because the process you're doing this you know, again and again and again, and that builds uh, the culture. What we did, we, we drove a lot of initiatives. We, of course, measured and uh, managed the gender wage gap. But what was important for us is that we, we increased flexibility and decentralization within the company. Uh, so we have no offices. We have flat organizational structure. Uh, we have flexibility. Uh, if, if, if your uh, child is sick, you work for, for from home, if, if your child doesn't have daycare, you can take your child with you to work. All these kind of things which give flexibilities to workers are, are very important in, in my, my mind. We have also systematically, because we are in a tech industry, tried to increase the uh, number of women in, in man-dominant uh, uh, departments. So, and we have uh, programs for women in tech, and we, we have started because w one of the problems is that uh, women are not applying to our company, so we, we have gone to the uh, universities and even to the uh, high schools and, and, and uh, uh, schools to educate women on what we do, uh, so it's an interesting jo job for them. So uh, when we got the Gender Equality Awards, we were very happy. And we were thinking, why were we so happy? Because in, in, my, in my mind, it's not only f for women we are doing this. It's, it's as, as, as you were pointing out, it's, it's for uh, the company and it's for success. So we were very happy because in our mind, it showed that we were a professional company. We were a professionally run company, a good company, which is uh, good for everybody to work in, a company that promotes diversity, a lot of ideas, uh, et cetera. So and we believe that you know people want to work for these kind of uh, companies. Uh, so in our mind, uh, promoting gender equality is 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 not only only uh, you know for women. It, it's it's good business at the end of the day. So so we we were very pr happy about this. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Next time it will be interesting to hear uh, of your experience of merging two companies, two big companies where one is really uh, 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 gender uh, focused and the other one less so. But that remains to be discussed later. Our next speaker is Hanna Birna Kristjánsdóttir. Hanna Birna is an experienced politician, former minister of the interior in Iceland and former mayor of the city of Reykjavik. Currently, she is chair of the executive board of Women Political Leaders uh, Global Forum. And uh, she has recently been recruited as a senior advisor at uh, UN Women. Hanna Birna will reflect on several effective legislative measures and the successful implementation in Iceland. Please, Hanna Birna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you today. Thanks to the organizers of the event, thanks to World Bank for your continuous work on gender equality, because we that work closely in the gender equality industry, if you like, internationally, we know how great, uh, how great and important your work is, not only on the issues we're discussing here today, but just in general. And to see a woman lead that is really important. And I know that since uh, Kristalina Georgieva joined in 2017, this has been even more 
sort of seen on the international scene how much World Bank is doing, so congratulations on that. And to the ministers, thank you so much. I've yet again, I'm not going to do that again. I've often talked about how much the foreign minister of Iceland is focusing on gender equality. Thanks again for that. And thanks to all of you for joining us here today. I was asked to talk about what can the public sector do. Uh, and I'm going to do that just by pointing out three issues. Uh, first of all, the public sector, meaning the legislative part, can make sure that the di discriminatory law that we still live by are abolished. That's number one, two, and three, really. It's super simple. If a country looks at this report that we have in front of us, they can see what is lacking in their community. So that would be my first advice. Just make sure that the laws, and that we're talking about this in 2019, is of course extraordinary. But there are only six countries that make sure that women and men are seen the same in front of the law. So that's an easy uh, target, if you like. Secondly, I would advise the public sector to be a little more innovative than they have been. That's the same as Kristalina Georgieva pointed out earlier. If you are going to take the extra step, the extra mile, and make sure that you do something extraordinary for gender equality, take the extra mile. Do something more than just reviewing the laws that are in place. Iceland has done this, and I'm going to touch upon that a bit, uh, a bit later. Thirdly, the public sector has to make sure that we strive against the traditional stereotype world that we have lived in. I mean, this is a fundamental issue. We are not only fighting politicians and asking th them to change things or companies to change things. We are also fighting the brains within ourselves. And that is a big, big hurdle. So I would say these three issues are vital if the public se sector is going to make sure that we live in a gender equal world. And how has Iceland done? Because, excuse me for that, but we Icelanders tend to always find a way to make sure that we get to the point of Iceland, especially when it comes to gender equality, because we're so super proud of it. And I think that is one of the successes we have. I mean, I'm looking in front of the all the faces here, and the women are just as proud in their face when I mention gender equality as Iceland in Iceland as men are. So that is a real uh, asset in itself. Iceland has, of course, tried to make sure that we live in an equal law state where there is uh, an equality against the law. But in this report, we see that there is some difference. But I think the greatest success of Iceland is the point number two. We have gone the extra mile. We have done trama dramatic things when it comes to gender equality, when it comes to paternity law. And I have this phrase when people ask me, when do you really experience gender equality? And for me personally, I would say, it's when I wake up with my husband next to me in the middle of the night and my daughters cry out for their father just as well as for me. And when that change, when, th when we have that change in front of us, when this is as much their responsibility, everything else has changed. So I Iceland has done that. Iceland has done things when it comes to equal pay. Iceland has done things when it comes to domestic violence and harassment. So all these issues are the dramatic things that Iceland has done. And in addition to that, we are of course living in a society of humongously cor courageous women and fairly reasonable men, <laughs> which, <laughs> makes <sure laughs> which makes sure that this is a consensus issue in Iceland. And that is, I think, sort of the, 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 the glow in the dream. Why have we gone the extra mile? Because we all see it as a super beneficial thing. We all take pride in it. It's the consensus across party lines. In Parliament, for example, everybody raises their hands when the issue is gender equality. Because there it is a consensus thing, which is sort of the beauty of it all. So courageous women and, and fairly kind and reasonable men make sure that we, we do these great things. But again, all my thanks to the World Bank for making sure we have the figures, because we can always say it's just and fair, but we need to point out figures. And sometimes when I'm lost for argument in a big group of men, sometimes, and I've taken out the card of fairness and what is just and how should society be, I take the card of figures and facts, and if it doesn't work, I tell them then that in societies that praise gender equality, they live longer. And then I have them. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Hanna Birna, and I'm sure that you noticed that you got a very, very good applause here. Uh, you make it sound simple, and maybe it is, and at least everyone needs an encouragement, and we have one here. Uh, our third and last micro-presenter is Kondwani MacDonald Mahone, a UNU uh, guest fellow and a gender development officer from um, the Ministry of Gender in Malawi. Uh, Kondwani will discuss gender equality initiatives in uh, Malawi, and uh, we see uh, Malawi as one of the uh, rising, uh, rising countries in, in Africa doing a lot of improvement, and the floor is yours now. Good evening. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, Malawi, as a nation, we have the constitution. And in that constitution, we have provisions which try to promote and enhance human rights. And gender equality being one of the human rights, yes, it does. And it also tries to uh, ensure that it addresses all issues to do with discrimination of any form. And we also have another provision, which is chapter 29, which uh, tries to enhance the participation of women, uh, especially in the economic sector. Not only the constitution of Malawi, we also have other policies uh, which were developed and are being implemented. For example, we do have the national gender policy, which was developed in 2015. We also have uh, uh, Wills and Inheritance Act, which was developed in 2013, and uh, many more. And not also forgetting to mention that apart from the policies, we do have the national action plans. For example, we have the national action plan on women economic empowerment. So all these are the tools which uh, we are being uh, implementing as a nation to at least see uh, women uh, involvement being increasing day by day. Uh, I will just mention some of the interventions which I will try to link with the policies and the acts. Uh, one of the interventions which we really sincerely and will make sure that we it's, it's, it's being followed is the implementation of the 60-40 quota, which is illustrated in uh, the Gender Equality Act of 2013 uh, during the selection or when we are pointing out the beneficiaries of all the projects, being it developmental, or all the projects being it economical or social uh, development projects. We also knew and we also know that uh, the society which we are living down there in Africa is patriarchal. I know maybe it's just even, but then we still feel it that the society needs to be guided to some extent, to discuss with them to some extent. So the ministry tries to uh, raise awareness in as far as gender-based virus is concerned, trying to negotiate with the uh, main and see how best we can involve main in promoting of women's rights, especially the economic part of uh, women's life. Uh, we also try to make sure that we remove, as a ministry that is, to remove the patriarchal trends which uh, in the most of the societies, I would say, uh, by engaging most especially female uh, leaders. I know maybe those of you who have been uh, leading uh, or maybe having uh, some uh, uh, findings in Malawi uh, with maybe UN, you have heard about uh, TA Kachindamoto, TA Mwaza. They are women, but then they are trying to uh, advocate for women's rights, uh, the girls' rights, promoting a girls' education. So we try to make sure that we uh, engage them in the policy advocacy. As Malawi, we also try as much as possible to make sure that we're enhancing participation of women in uh, political or I would say decision-making positions, which is very important because mostly as we talk about women's particip participation, we talk about figures. We don't talk about uh, how uh, are we contributing, or how are they contributing to the decisions? So these and some more are some of the interventions which the country uh, uh, 
being Malawi uh, doing or uh, being uh, 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 is, is, is implementing. But I would say, finally, uh, we might have the policies, well-crafted, uh, very good when we need it, but then there's implementation. But then at the center of all this, we look at the, the powerless women in the society, and we try to make sure that we engage them in as far as we can to make sure that they, reali they realize their importance in the development, they realize their importance in the economic growth of the country, and making sure that they have to create, we have to create demand of uh, all the developments and all the interventions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this, Konvani. Uh, I regret that we do not have the uh, time to have any discussions, but it would be interesting to to hear more and ask you questions. And and uh, but that is unfortunately not so. This case, in this case, we have now uh, reached the second half, or so to speak. And let me invite to take a seat here at the stage for the panel conversation, uh, Kristalina Georgieva. Guðlaug Þór Þórðarsson, Hanna Birna Kristjánsdóttir, and a special welcome to Ulla Turnes, Minister of Development Cooperation in the Danish government. We will now have half an hour of, uh, uh, to discuss issues highlighted in the report. It touches on many important issues, but the most striking message of the report is that globally, women are accorded only three quarters of the legal rights that men enjoy, according to the new uh, index that has been released here today. This constrains women's ability to get jobs, and uh, start businesses and make uh, economic decisions that are best for them and their families and in fact for the societies also. I would like to start by inviting uh, Minister Ulla Turnes, Minister for Development Cooperation of Denmark, to open this panel with remarks on how Denmark, that scores highest on the eight uh, uh, index World Bank indexes here, uh, how the government, how Denmark works to encourage and sustain women's inclusion in the labor market towards a more gender uh, equal society. Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be part, to be part of uh, this panel. And uh, first, of course, I would like really to stress that we are, of course, very, very proud of the score in the report. Uh, and I believe that Denmark indeed is among the most equal countries of the world. Right. So the report is, is, in my opinion, also correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Danish women have one of the world's largest labor or, or, or highest labor market participation rates and in Denmark, men and women share household work. <laughs> <laughs> Danes, Danes are also among those uh, who are most satisfied with their work-life balance, and this, I think, is also a very important part of, the, of, of this report. But even though uh, Denmark has come far in terms of equality of opportunity, Good scores should not make us complacent, of course. Progress achieved for gender equality should not be perceived as definitive and uh, irreversible, as they could, of course, roll back if we lose focus on where we are. Uh, and allow me to give you uh, few, a few examples of some of our challenges and how we work to overcome them. And these challenges, they might be very similar to the ones that we heard from Iceland. 
because Denmark is um, lagging behind in some measurements of gender equality. While women's participation rate in the labor market is high, the labor market itself suffers from relatively high level of gender segregation. Also, there are few women in management positions. There are still few women in management positions and boards, and we have still not achieved equal pay for equal work. Some of these challenges are correlated, of course. When, when mothers take the majority of the maternity leave, when girls and boys continue to choose their education and career, according to traditional gender views, it creates less flexibility for the individual and for the society. At the same time, it limits the individual to reach her full, his or her full uh, capacity, and thus means uh, that resources and talent are not fully utilized. One of the things we have done uh, to improve this in Denmark is to introduce rules, targets, and policy on gender balance in private, in private company boards. The rules make it mandatory uh, for large company, companies, public institutions, and state-owned enterprises to set targets for, under, for the underrepresented sex in management and take measures to increase representation at all, at all other management levels and to report on progress at a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a way for us to increase women's uh, representation in management without using quotas, mm -hmm. which there was no political um, majority for, uh, for introducing quotas in, in, in Denmark. So far, these targets uh, has, has, has resulted in an increase from 16.1% in 2012 to 28% in 2017 of women uh, represented at the boards of the 20 largest companies, higher actually than the EU average of 24.6 in, in, in 2017. So uh, a way to achieve results without really um, uh, introducing a quota system. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we share many of the hurdles. We have not necessarily gone the same ways with regard to the mm -hmm. quotas, uh, but they have uh, uh, turned, given us returns in, the, in this country and in Norway as well. But let me now turn to you, Minister Gullur uh, Thor. You emphasize engaging <coughs> men and boys mm -hmm. In, for gender equality. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, in your view, how can we fight the harmful social and cultural norms that are often the main obstacles in gender responsive law and policies, and often also in the reason why they are not implemented? Well, I hope that we can add to that, Icelanders. Mm. And uh, I thought Hanna Bidna she put this very well when she was talking about yeah. our experience. There is consensus when it comes to those things in Iceland. One would think, listen to Hannah Bidna, that there is consensus about most things in Iceland. It is not. <laughs> we argue a lot. But uh, we do have seen a enormous change when it comes to gender equality in Iceland through the last few decades. And I, I'm not going to thank everyone, especially the women leaders who have fought that battle. But there's, I, haven't, I have never met anyone, and then men who says, I would like to go back. Mm -hmm. Because it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a lot of us for us boys and uh, men. I, I guess I'm not a boy anymore, but uh, <laughs> I sometimes feel like it, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's something that's a, that's a secret. But. Uh, and one reason it's economically beneficial, I think, is that uh, when you do have uh, a diversity, for example, when you're making decisions, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it makes no difference if it's a, it's a uh, firm or, or a political party mm -hmm. or so on. If uh, you do not have a diversity at the table when you are uh, making decisions, then something is lacking. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we say, uh, tell uh, positive stories 
because uh, it, it shouldn't be, uh, if, if it's for, uh, for men, it's something that they, like, they need to be defensive because they're gonna lose something. Mm -hmm. Then it will be, uh, it mm -hmm. will be tough to climb mm -hmm. that wall. But if they see the benefi benefits, then uh, it's so much, so much mm -hmm. easier. And uh, so I hope that the little Iceland have uh, a story to tell. This is a cornerstone in our uh, foreign policy. has been f for quite a long time. And it doesn't matter if it's defense and security. One would say, why defense and security? Because it matters there. Mm -hmm. It matters a lot. And for example, we find in our ministry that if we do not have in certain areas, we do not have the, uh, women at the table, mm. or then, uh, then it's much less likely that the, the decisions making will be as good and uh, of course it uh, also comes when it comes to trade and uh, development programs mm -hmm. empowerment of women i think are crucial to everywhere but especially when it comes to development development program mm -hmm. and it was a great experience to go to malawi as i do it in the beginning of the year it's very easy to fall in love with uh, malawi one of the most beautiful places in the world but there like everywhere there's a, a job to be done, but it's absolutely great. I want to uh, thank you for uh, your contribution of ending uh, child marriages and uh, early childbearing, which is a big thing. And I, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, what I just, I think it's very important. Well, the answer for me is that we need to tell uh, the story when we are successful, when we see that people and men, because it's often about men, they don't want to go back mm -hmm. for, the, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's data is something that helps a lot. But also, it's just good to uh, tell stories for people who have experienced it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think you answered the question. <laughs> it's about being positive. It's about believing in yourself. It's about team building. Mm -hmm. And it's about consensus that uh, uh, we are doing good things and we don't want to go back to the states where, where there were where conflicts more than, uh, more than uh, synergies. Uh, now, uh, Madame Georgieva, for the past 10 years, the World Bank has collected data on women's ac economic participation worldwide and the legal frameworks that limit or influence their choice and activity. And the data shows progress, but quite slow. It is not fast enough. As you said, you are not going to see it in your lifetime unless we speed things up. Uh, what is the bank doing currently in facilitating change and uh, support to women's economic participation and access to finance? Uh, how will, are you going to follow up on the new reports? Uh, well, uh, thank you for the, uh, for the uh, question. Uh, and I will start with a part of the answer that links straight to your storytelling. We at the World Bank generate these, some of these stories through our development work. Mm -hmm. Stories that life is better for men and women when women participate. And one of my uh, favorite stories was being in Niger, where we had a um, um, cash support program. Mm -hmm. And that cash support program actually favored putting the money in the hands of the women. Mm -hmm because experience shows that women, especially in very tough conditions, will be more uh, likely to invest in the family in a more sustainable manner. So I'm asking the, the men, I said, okay, so we gave them the money to the women. How did you feel about it? And one of the men answered, uh, you know, I f first I wasn't happy, but then mm. if you gave me the money, mm. I would have bought a bicycle mm. and my family would have been hungry. Mm. Uh, that examples when actually men recognize that there is a role for women to manage resources responsible is something that we have seen time and again coming from banks' uh, <coughs> projects. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question more fully, we invest in four things systematically. The first one is relentlessly invest in good data. Uh -huh. Make sure that people actually can, 
tap into what we offer as a global public good and build this data for analysis that can then inform mm -hmm. decision making. Two, we actually work a lot with countries on legal framework and institutions. And we always make sure that we look at all aspects of good governance. And obviously, equality, gender equality, including, I mean, including women is part of good governance. As uh, the minister said, we make better decisions when all perspectives are <laughs> represented. Three, we then use our financing to relentlessly drive gender equality from girls in school. And actually, I would uh, uh, present to you that we are particularly keen to see girls in school in uh, fragile states. Uh, in Afghanistan, for example, it was and is one of our priorities. When we started 15 years ago working in Afghanistan, only one million children in schools, 95% were boys. Today we have eight million children in school, 40% are girls. And actually, I admire the bra bravery of girls. Some of them go to school risking their lives in some areas where this is still actually uh, a tough a tough thing to do, to do and it, it shouldn't and for last but, but not least economic empowerment of women we work very very systematically on the whole spectrum that makes it possible for women to participate in the economy from identification we still have less women with ID than men to access to credit, uh, fintech, making sure that the digital economy works for everybo everybody, women included, massively increasing the number of women with uh, uh, bank accounts, to ability to capture management experience readily as men would, to selling goods on the market. Uh, and just to finish with, with uh, some very interesting uh, examples of, of this work, uh, we got the question of digital payment very much linked to gender equality, making sure that women get first row seat in transitioning from uh, paper-based payments to digital payments because once a woman has uh, well woman has to has uh, to have a digital ID to have a uh, to have an account once she has an account she is in charge and boy are we women good <laughs> when we are in charge of our money uh, my my favorite story is in <laughs> in in, uh, in Bangladesh uh, we uh, we supported transition to digital payment of salaries and a woman tells me so she got her money before in cash her mother-in-law would wait in the in the uh, front of the factory woman goes out mother-in-law takes the money now money is transmitted digitally mother-in-law cannot <laughs> touch it and the woman actually started her own business so we do quite a lot on the full spectrum and as you said, actually, I so much believe that generating these stories uh, is also part of our uh, mandate. Yeah. Well, I think you have given us very, very important messages here. And uh, uh, continue the good work. And we will surely collaborate as we can and share best practices and tell good stories. Uh, Hanna Birna, uh, I would uh, like to okay. now maybe uh, raise with you these are not the best, uh, but we are not, uh, over this 10 years period, we are not seeing uh, quite the results that we would mm -hmm. like to see. You are engaged constantly in uh, a dialogue with the women leaders all over the world. And uh, the, you are sharing solutions and good practices. Uh, in your view, 
what are perhaps the most crucial legal and regulatory uh, reforms countries can take to accelerate a women's leadership role mm -hmm. in society? I think there are numerous. I think uh, plenty of them are in this report, for example, and I would agree totally on the fact that although we are seeing progress, mm -hmm. we are not seeing it fast enough. And this, is, uh, this has to do with business, law, and women. When we look at other indexes, for example, regarding women leadership, education, all these things, we want to see it faster. And sadly, some of the indexes are even showing that our da daughters or even our granddaughters or grandsons will not see gender equality. So, of course, we are not moving in any way in the pace we would like. I, it varies a lot. I mean, I could say, I mean, there are totally different things for some parts of the world than for other parts of the world. I mean, we still live in a world where, for example, I think it's 100 countries where women are not allowed to do certain jobs. Mm -hmm. We even have countries still that w where a woman needs a permission from her man, mm -hmm. from her husband, to do things. We have countries where child marriages, we have places where girls don't get, get education and so on and so forth. And to try and sort of evaluate that in the perspective of, of us sitting here uh, in the panel is like nothing we can even right. comprehend. So I think uh, that's why I think it's so good how the World Bank has put this forward. It's just you have the countries and you can see where what you need to do just yeah. to make sure that people are equal in front of the laws. And let us uh, ponder a little on this. Le uh, let us just dwell on it for a second. Mm -hmm. I mean, how come we live in a world, I mean, we are, uh, let's say we're just having kids. I mean, we are all born equal, but we're still living in a world where it uh, affects 70% mm -hmm. of girls and women around the world that they do not have the same rights according to law and constitutions. And there is, this is excluded of all the sort of views they are faced with, all the harassment they are faced with, all the sort of strains on what they should do because they are girls and women. That is apart from all of that. This is just a legal framework. Mm -hmm. So I think it varies a lot from country to country, but I think we need to sort of, what I've, and now I'm beginning to be a little sort of, uh, the patience is, uh, and I think that's <laughs> the thing with gender equality. <laughs> uh, the thing with gender equality, can't you recall it? I mean, uh, uh, and um, I, I, I think it's even the same with men. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I actually thought that this would be solved when I was 30. I was like when the uh, uh, women that were elder, uh, older than me were saying like, uh, this isn't the way it should be. I'm like, I will not experience this. I mean, <laughs> this is not the way <laughs> things will be. And then you move in life and I think it's one of the sort of progressive ideologies. I mean, I'm way more of a feminist today than I ever was when I was 15 mm. or 20 or 25. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Because you are constantly confronted with uh, the, uh, the, the phrase you cannot or the bots or what have you. Mm. So I think, uh, I think we just need to sort of sit down. And I mean, I work with women parliamentarians around the world. I mean, I think women parliamentarians, we have he for she. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I saw you, uh, I saw a speech that you gave in Japan where you said so nicely, I mean, we have he for she, that's super great, but what about C for she? Mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. aren't we sort of making sure that the women around the world are doing what is needed to, I mean, women in parliament can sit down and say, where is the gap in my parliament? Let's make sure that this happens. And I'm sure the guys will join. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, I mean, it varies, but I mean, the first hurdle is, of course, to make sure that we're equal according to law. Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. would be the first thing. Uh, but then we have, I mean, we have an index, for example, that we introduced in Iceland when we had the Women Leaders Global Forum here in November, where, where our minister was, of course. And then we have what is called Reykjavik Index, which is sort of calculating or researching the general view mm -hmm. of the public to women in leadership position. And there we have 63 meaning that mm. uh, only a little more than half of the population, be it man or a woman, find it okay that you are in the position that you are. I mean, yeah. most of them would say, I think it should be a man, but I mean, so <laughs> we are still, it's still in our brains that we shouldn't be there. So I think, I mean, it comes with the fact that we, uh, maybe I'm just getting too old, I'm 52 and I'm feeling a little bit impatient about the whole thing, but I think we need to step up our game mm. and just make sure that it's, it's done, it can be done. I agree with you. <laughs> and we have a good start with, uh, with the scorecard yeah, that yeah, the yeah, World yeah, Bank yeah, is providing yeah, us with. Yeah. We are getting a little short of time. Uh, Minister Turnus, I would like to take uh, this opportunity and to address our role 
and accountability as donors in this context. The new report shows that one of the biggest areas of improvement are in sub-Sahara Africa, where laws on uh, affecting gender-based violence have been put in place. However, in the aftermath of the Me Too movement, staggering reports of gender-based violence or sexual mm -hmm. harassment uh, or abuse in the aid sector has surfaced. Mm -hmm. It seems that impunity has survived and prevailed with uh, some of the largest development agencies. Uh, what would be your take on that? And what actions can we as donors uh, take to end this impunity and to eradicate the uh, rampant violence? I am very, very sorry, but I just have to, I mean, uh, comment on what was just said because this was so interesting. I'm as impatient and <laughs> as you two are. Uh, I'm 56 and uh, I mean I'm eager to see more concrete results on this agenda as, as, as well as you are. And I just wanted to add to the very good points that you were saying that as, as long as a girl and a woman do not have the right to decide over her own body, we still have huge challenges in, 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 in this aspect. So just wanted to, to add that sexual and reproductive health and rights are, I mean, a key issue in Danish development policy. Sorry for this, Ambassador. <laughs> and getting back uh, to your question and uh, trying to, 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 to answer on that one. And um, I, I, I honestly believe that um, the recent cases of uh, sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment in and outside the multilateral system, along with the Me Too uh, movement, has really sharpened the attention for all of us. It has become clear that no organization, no agency, and no donor is too small or too developed to escape the risk of uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, or sexual harassment taking place within uh, their work uh, streams. Um, it is unfortunately a matter of culture. Uh, we, m we must ensure that we use the current momentum uh, wisely uh, to make sure that we move forward. We need to do more than merely reiterate that we as donor agencies take a strong stance on sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment and also other forms of abuse and misconduct. We must fuel action throughout the development sector. And I believe that strong, strong leadership, strong leadership is the key to this cultural transition. How can we expect that a person who is traumatized after experiencing abuse and exploitation will stand up against her perpetrator if the leadership turns uh, turns a blind eye, and if perpetrators are rarely brought to account uh, for their actions. I'm pleased to see that, uh, that so many initiatives across our global development sector. This will hopefully enable us to pinpoint the greatest risk and to identify the most effective measures to prevent sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment cases from happening and to bring existing cases to light. We should be aware that this intensified attention will expose more cases and we should apply a no tolerance for inaction approach. For Denmark, it is essential to secure this cultural trans transition in collaboration with um, a multitude of multilateral and civil society partners. Only then we will secure a sustainable transition towards a culture of trust and professionalism in which accountabil account accountably for perpetrators and respect for survivors uh, prevail. For this reason, I met at an early stage with all Danish civil society partners to stress the importance and urgency of this matter. This has led to commitment on both sides and a strengthening of, safe, of safeguarding measures. In my opinion, we, was, we must work on several tracks. 
First of all, we must ensure highest level buy-in from donor and multilateral agencies. Secondly, we must work with partners to strengthen timely and adequate investigations and follow-up. And finally, we must seek to harmonize our efforts. The protection and well-being of our beneficiaries is crucial, of course. Finally, we have to keep in mind the importance of leading by example, which means walking the talk also as donors. In Denmark, the Me Too uh, movement triggered a number of initiatives to combat sexual harassment at the workplace. Our ministers for gender equality and employment sent a joint message to leaders in private and public institutions calling for an end to sexual harassment, recalling that sexual harassment never is the responsibility of the individual. In April uh, last year, a public hearing on sexual harassment was carried out involving the government and representatives from labor unions and employers. In December last year, we changed the Equal Treatment Act to sharpen focus on sexual harassment in the workplace and increase the average level of compensation in cases related to sexual harassment. Thank you. Very important uh, points. I was wondering if maybe we could now close the panel by uh, each and every one of you having a little remark. We have touched upon very different subjects here and uh, we all go with uh, quite uh, good messages back from, from uh, this event here. Hanna Birna, would you like to start reflecting a little bit? What are you going to do to kind of follow up uh, on the engagement and the enthusiasm that we have uh, been fueled with here? Thank you. I'm going to change the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's my aim as usual. <laughs> no, but I, I just would like to stress the fact that I think it's vital. And again and again, I would like to thank you, Kristalina, because I know, I, I, we all know, and I, I know that from working with women leaders around the world, that it can be fairly tricky to make sure that this is sort of taken as the serious issue it is. So uh, I really uh, think it's really great how you put it forward in making sure that people understand that there is also an economic gain here. It's, uh, it's not just a women's issue fighting for their own sort of right, if you like, but it's, it's also an issue that has to do with our economy and how uh, we will live in the future. So, so thank you so much for that. I mean, my field, of course, is mostly around women leadership, uh, and I would just like to leave you with some facts and figures on that. I mean, this is, again, 2019, and we still have in parliaments 22% women, the other ones are men. In cabinets, we have 17%, the other ones are men. And heads of states are under uh, 10. They were 7% when I last looked. So this is the situation today. And I think when young girls and young boys don't see role models, we're again and again seeing pictures of the world states where we have to search for women. I mean, we can find one and two, and this is it. Uh, and I think it doesn't just go to sort of saying to the politicians or the public sector, make the change we want. We need to make it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why, uh, in the end, I would just like to stress the fact that, I mean, we are seeing when it comes to researching the attitudes of the general public that we are still seeing power and leadership dressed in dark suit and being a middle-aged man. This is still the vision we have of power leadership and the, the persons that should be guiding us, uh, not on the world stage just, but also nationally and everywhere else. We have to change that image. It has to go from early age and follow through. So what you were saying, leading by example is super tough, but it needs to be done. And when we, for example, look at politics, and we, we're always talking about how can we get more women into politics? How can we get more women into tech? How can we get more women into finances, et cetera, et cetera? In politics, for example, the debate more is now about how can we make them stay? Because they just enter and then they leave. So we also have to think about the environment and how we deal with things. I mean, politics, I say, and I say it again and again, it's still the game of the guys. They're inviting us to tag along. And when that's the attitude in leadership, and one has to just say it out frank, because some, some men still feel that they are losing something instead of them gaining something, which they obviously are. 
by being involved in, in something else and the whole sort of swear of life, so I can I leave on a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, researches yeah. and figures yeah. also show that people that live in gender equal societies are happier. Isn't that something? Yeah. I mean, yeah. can't yeah. we aim for that? Yeah. <laughs> so thanks. Kristalina, yeah. uh, uh, mm. uh, would you like maybe to... to yeah. Very, very briefly. Mm. We are seeing in our world a lot of good. Mm -hmm. It is getting wealthier. Mm. There are more opportunities, technology is changing the way we work, but we also see in our world a lot that is really troubling. We see more conflicts, climate change is hitting us on the head with a very big hammer, self-created, self uh, and we see unfortunately more, not less, inequalities. To take that and say, okay, is this what I want for my children, for my grandchildren, a world that is actually getting worse off rather than better off, is at the heart of the conversation we have here. Gender equality is one of these determinants of a fair world, a good, good, good place for people to, to, um, to, to see their children's future. And I always say that, in my whole life as a woman, I very honestly had to work harder than my colleagues, men, to be equal. Mm. As a professor, I was to teach twice as many classes as the, other, as the guys somehow. It always ended up me doing more. When I went to the bank, it was a bit of the same. You know, you have to prove yourself more to be equal. And ma the moral for me, very much like, like uh, you're putting it, the moral for me is that it is us to change it. And I want my daughter, my granddaughter, to be equal just because they mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. for no other reason. Thank you. Uh, Minister Guðlaugur Thór, you are in the position now of being the only male on the panel. <laughs> uh, usually this is what has been uh, quite the, the reality of women, being one in politics, being one on the board, being one in the workplace and maybe not rising to the critical mass. Mm. How does it feel? And what is your drive? Because you are, uh, you have a drive in, in, uh, 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 and a vision in this context. Could you share that with us? First of all, I like it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and uh, maybe I was a bit uh, fortunate also in that sense that I never quite understood the problem mm -hmm. as a kid. Because my uh, mother, she was uh, working at uh, the office at the municipalities and uh, for example, uh, and uh, when she quit, uh, there were two men hired to do her job, talking about you know mm -hmm. working harder than the men. <laughs> so uh, it's very hard for anyone to explain to me that women couldn't do everything that men, men did. And at the same time, it's, I think it's also important, I was fortunate, and uh, it's some t very seldom is talked about, is that my father, he had uh, that self-confidence, it was no problem. Uh, my mother always had higher, or usually higher uh, wages than him, but it didn't bother him. And I think that uh, we need to address this as a common thing, maybe uh, more than Hannah uh, Bidnes, of course, we have been uh, going a long way back in, in the same political party, and uh, we have always often tried to, uh, I've often tried to get people to uh, run for offices, and mostly m women, that's more pre usually more problematic. One of the reasons that no one talks about is that because of, of the husbands. Because they just, they feel threatened mm -hmm. that the wife can be uh, more successful or uh, getting, uh, climbing some ladders that they are not climbing. And, and that's just a serious problem. So uh, I think because you were asking about what, what we can do, I think we need, need to address those things are they uh, as they is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a common thing. Uh, you all mentioned that when we're talking about stories, it's good to have data. One of the data says it will be a happier society. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. And I honestly believe it will be a better society if we uh, 
if we if we we change it. And I also think, and uh, one of the reason I'm not that negative, I, I I think it's good to get results to be positive. And when I address this to men, and I address this both in Iceland and also in other countries, and it's very interesting to uh, discuss to people uh, or men uh, just drink beer. I, I think the uh, the best way is try to have some positive uh, yeah. messages. It's just good for them because it's often about they are holding on to something. And uh, one I think that I would like, uh, and I know that we are not going to discuss it now, but uh, I usually bring this up which I think is a gender thing. It's about gender equality. It's a new challenge, at least I think in uh, Iceland and in many countries around us, which is really a gender thing that you feel now that there are problems with young boys, for example, in Iceland. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem. And it's a gender equality thing when if we address it as li th like that I think it's more likely that we will have uh, we will have a, a world uh, or uh, societies that uh, could say gender equal society so the doesn't make any difference I mean I have both I have two boys and two girls and I just seriously want them to just uh, I, I don't want to be the same I, I don't want them to do something they don't, don't like but I don't I just want them to have opportunities. And I don't want to live in a society that someone says, okay, sorry, I know that you will be probably good at this, and uh, of course it would be good for you, but you're a girl, so we're gonna, or you're a boy. So uh, I just honestly believe this is the right path to go, and I think this is something worth fighting for. All of this is more or less outlined in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, on the, uh, in the, uh, development goals of the, of the world, it's equality and uh, health, mm -hmm. education. Uh, thank you all, but Ulla, would you, um, can I ask you to have the <laughs> closing remarks of this panel? Yes, um, and uh, I mean, um, let me just finalize by really thanking you, Kristalina, and the World Bank. I think I think this is a fantastic report. It's really a fantastic report, the way it is constructed, and it, it helps us also to keep different countries and government accountable. I have marked our uh, uh, partner countries where they are placed in, in, in the ranking. Uh, so, I mean, I have something to discuss with them on, 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 on these matters. So thank you very much, fantastic report. Uh, for me, as it has been said uh, by, by, by my colleagues here in the panel, this is an issue of human rights, mm -hmm. basic human rights, mm -hmm. but it's also an issue of smart economy. Mm -hmm. uh, we know from other reports that we can increase uh, the global GDP with up to 25%. Mm -hmm. If women are getting access and opportunities and... and, and <coughs> opportunities of, of, of also contributing with their potential um, to develop their uh, community and societies. So, so for me, it's also smart politics. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to use this opportunity to mention a study. I don't remember whether it's from Harvard University or of, of, of but from some, some US university where um, a um, thesis was handed in uh, anonymously uh, by a man and a woman mm -hmm. and and then by when it was signed with the name yep. and um, the mm -hmm. woman got the lowest rate mm -hmm. uh, it was the same report mm -hmm. um, so um, I mean we have challenges mm -hmm. in yep. this um, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. over the world I think mm -hmm. but being Minister for Development Cooperation I'm of course uh, um, mostly uh, occupied by uh, the developing world and um, the fight for the women who do not have access to the microphone that I have mm -hmm. is the fight that mm -hmm. I'm fighting. Mm -hmm. um, some colleagues back home are doing the thing with uh, the um, equal pay for equal work uh, at home. But, but uh, I really think that we have a huge job to do uh, globally and personally, I do not think that we will achieve the very nice goals yes. behind us yep. if we are not addressing the number five. Mm -hmm. And this report helps us addressing the number five and what is needed uh, exactly. to also achieve five and all the rest. Thank you very much.
So these were, the these were the final words, and I hope that uh, you have all found it worthwhile to be here with us uh, this evening. Thank you to the panelists and to the speakers, and for the informative uh, dialogue that has taken place. And uh, we, I think we agree that tracking progress also serves the purpose of, of keeping governments on track. And, uh, that uh, uh, the World Bank is doing. Thank you for this report and uh, thank you all for coming.